when you have a purpose, when you have a reason, um, all these things like you know being worried about you know, threats and stuff like that, you don't think about them at all. Welcome to Global Perspectives. This week, it's my pleasure to bring to you a brave young American man who's moved back to his native homeland of Iraq, where he's fighting to preserve the Chaldean Christian heritage and peoples, as well as bringing a taste of America to the local population. Join me. Normati, thank you so much for joining me on Global Perspectives. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. So, Noor, I want our audience to understand, where are you right now as we speak? I, I live in uh, Erbil. Um, that's in northern Iraq, within the Kurdistan region. It's an autonomous region, kind of like how, you know, you have like Scotland uh, and within the UK. So, it's own government here, So, but uh, we're still technically inside Iraq. And, uh, and Noor, you are a young man who was born in Iraq. Your family fled the country and eventually came to the United States as refugees. And you grew up in the United States and you make your way back to Iraq. Tell us what inspired you to go to your home country. Well, I mean, I think when I did it 13, 14 years ago, it was like a unique uh, story, but this is part of the new generation. It's, I'm not uh, unique anymore. I have met countless of young people who have roots from the Middle East, be it, you know, um, be it Iraq, Syria, Turkey, uh, Israel, Egypt, growing up in the West because their families move for whatever reason. So I personally was just trying to see where I fit in in this world. You know, I graduated from college, you know, that period of time where you don't know what to do with your life. And I was disconnected from my roots. So I said, why not just visit, see see how it goes. And then I still slowly started to like uh, living here and being part of the community. So that turned to become an even stronger meaning when uh, ISIS happened. And, you know, you, you want to be help, helping to be part of that well, and, and I'm, Nora, I'm going to stop you there because I want to, I want to talk about um, your experience once you got there over the years. Um, and so, so just to stay on this for a moment. So you arrive in Iraq as a young man. You are kind of rediscovering your heritage and your roots. And if I understand correctly, very soon after that, you launch what is called uh, Radio Babylon, Babylon FM, which is the first all English language radio station in Iraq. Tell me um, how that is going for you and what your audience is like. Yeah, I mean, you know, with, with, uh, with Iraq after 2003, everything is new. And like, there's lots of, there was a, a need for many different things. And this thing, I've, been, I've had the pleasure to watch it evolve and become modern. In 2012, um, you know, I, I went up to an existing media company called Babylon Media and said, let's do this all English idea where, you know, this looks like it's going to be the future where there will be more English speakers in, in Iraq. And it wasn't like that at the time, 10 years ago. But I mean, everything looked like that was the direction the country was heading to. So let's give the younger audience an alternative uh, for media. And they loved it. So and we started it and it exploded. And it's been a source for young people to connect to the West, but it's also a source for older people to practice their English. It's a source for free entertainment, and it and it's been a source for like a a, a lifeline to to the rest of the world for some people, especially during the 2014 and 2015 occupation days of of ISIS in nearby Mosul, where all the TV and all of the satellites were destroyed, and so the residents who were under the occupation of ISIS, the only entertainment they had was hidden radios, where we would try to go and and and, and pen, you know, and, and and go inside the the city in order for them to hear us, because of course no internet, everything was controlled, and that was the most beautiful time after the liberation. People were sending us messages from Mosul City. We were listening to you guys, and you guys were telling us about what's happening, and you were the only one. That was making fun of ISIS. And so 
yeah, it's been a, it's been a heck of a ride with the radio station. So, Noor, you just mentioned that you were making fun of ISIS. Um, what what did that mean? And uh, I understand that this was obviously at the threat of your own life. Yeah, we would have this segment, you know, called the the animal of the day, and almost every single time, they were the winners because of some really tragic thing that we would hear about them doing in the occupied areas. But you know. Um, when you have a purpose, when you have a reason, um, all these things like, you know, being worried about, you know, threats and stuff like that, you don't think about them at all. Well, listen, you're, you're a brave person. And, uh, and the fact that you take on ISIS again at the, at the threat of your own life, it really speaks volumes about you. Just, just so our audience could hear it. Um, how do you say that animal of the day in Arabic? How do you say that? Wahshi. Okay. Wahshi. So, and, Say it again. Wahshi of the day. Wahshi of the day, right. So the Wahshi of the day is often ISIS. Um, and, I, and I think that um, for people who are Arabic speakers, that's just incredibly amusing. Nor maybe you could also share for us on, uh, on a more serious note, what the experience was like for Iraqis as ISIS started to take over and use the most horrible, brutal tactics against the local populations. Yeah, you know, I've, I've been living here for 14 years and for the most part, it's been great. Uh, it's been the best of life that I could ever ask for. But the most difficult time uh, I could ever imagine was that period, the 2014 up to 2017 period where um, the ISIS occupation did more than just uh, unfortunately take lives. It even destroyed the mental state of the people who are still alive. Um, and in so many different ways. So it was a psychological war and not just a, you know, a, a, an actual physical war of, of torture and, and killing. So uh, it, it, after, when it was prolonging month after month, it started some people to, to, to ask, like, is this the new reality? That's it. A third of the country will continue to be a terrorist state and people will not be able to return to their areas. Um, that was the worst kind of a uh, pain because you, there's no, there's no cure for mental pain of that nature. You know, when you have a wound, you can, you can, you can patch it. You have medical support, but psychological, psychologically, it was, it was the worst. Um, cause in Iraq, we're used to deaths. We've had wars since 1980s, since 1970s. We've, we've had everybody have a relative, you know, unfortunately die and, and in tragic ways, but with ISIS, it was a whole different psychological war that was really becoming like the norm until finally uh, we had the liberation happen. And and what part of what ISIS did in the region was uh, actually commit genocide against different religious and ethnic minority groups. Now, your family, if I understand correctly, you're um, Chaldean Christian by background. And being on the ground in Iraq, you were inspired to try to do something about this destruction and devastation that you were witnessing all around you. Can you tell us a bit about uh, how you decided to fight back? Well, the people who are from the areas that ISIS never occupied, like let's say the Kurdistan region areas, Erbil, Duhok, Suleimani, many community leaders try to find different ways to help. And everybody was trying to do the, anything they could to because overnight we had people sleeping on, on our streets or sleeping in where we work at, where our, our jobs became a makeshift for displaced people. So everybody was trying to just find different ways to help. Me personally, I had, I was, I was unique in that I had privilege of living in the U.S. So that gave me a connection that many people didn't have. So I thought of reconnecting with my friends back in Detroit and saying, Hey, we'll do a real simple system. You send the money. We'll help people and then we'll prove to you that the money was spent by creating this foundation where we send pictures and videos and receipts and translation of receipts for you. And so that quickly grew um, and it quickly helped establish uh, um, uh, trust among us here and the people abroad. So it was our duty to try to do what we can to the people of, uh, of Nineveh, Gov Nineveh Plains and, and other places that displaced families came from. 
And thankfully, um, it, it worked. And this is one of the few, I mean, this is one of the things that it was not impossible if we didn't have modern technology and internet and phones. And, we're, and we, should, we should remind ourselves, we, you know, we always talk about how much, unfortunately, technology hurt us. But how about a kid like me who was able to create you know, a, a line a, of source to help people here simply because of the internet and the phone and, and, and social media? And it, so, it is pretty incredible. And so if I understand correctly, you created a foundation called the Shlama Foundation. And, uh, and so maybe you could tell us a bit about the work. I, you were helping uh, individuals one-on-one. -on -one. Um, what else have you been doing? Yeah, so, well, not just me, of course. It's a, it's a team of volunteers in, in the U.S. and here. And yeah, we first started first with just emergency assistance. When families were living here with us, displaced families. It was just a lot of food, medicine, food, medicine, food, medicine. But um, when families finally went back to their liber liberated areas, that's when the real rehabilitation began. That's when the real recovery began. So we go in there and we fully revamp it to, um, you know, um, helping restore water in, in certain places, to improving electricity, to uh, bringing back uh, social community centers, um, you know, supporting the, the places that matter to the people here, like churches and, and, and whatnot. And, and of course, we, we do this uh, inclusive, like in, a, in an inclusive kind of a way. Um, and every place has a diverse of minorities. And while we, you know, and our diaspora comes from the Assyrian Christian minority, we also try to also help as many different uh, people in the area as well. The Yazidis, of course, and, and, and Turkmen's and everybody else. Yes, and in fact, you know, I think some of some of the um, surprising information that people don't necessarily understand about places like Iraq and Iran, where I come from, is the ethnic and religious diversity that exists there. Um, but I'd love to stay uh, for a moment in our conversation on the um, the issue of the Christian population in Iraq. Now, this is a very ancient community. Um, what many people sometimes don't remember is that when you look at the Middle East, you have Judaism and then comes Christianity and then after that comes Islam. So the Chaldean Christian community in Iraq predates the Islamic presence there. Um, what have you been doing in terms of trying to preserve the heritage there? And, you know, could you tell our audience a bit about the level of destruction that ISIS caused in the country? Yeah. So, um, you know, when you talk about the, the Christian community of, of Iraq, and it's unfortunately the same thing with neighboring Syria, it's an ethnic religious minority. This community is even older than Christianity. It comes with a language and a culture that's, old, that's older than Christianity itself. It's a nation of 4,000 years old and dates its roots back to 6,000 years ago in terms of um, you know, um, uh, different uh, part of its uh, culture and heritage. So, uh, you know, you can be a Christian anywhere, but you can't be like who you are in terms of ethnicity uh, if it's not in your homeland. Um, so, unfortunately, since 2003, uh, the, the Christian community has lost 90% of its population. So, 90% reduction is a really like an it's like an endangered rate, right? Where when you're down to such low numbers, that uh, culture, that uh, ethnicity might not survive. Sure, you can pack your bags and go again, be a Christian in America, but that language that you speak, the Aramaic language that you speak, which is 4,000 years old. Um, or 3,000 years old, you know, it's old, it's ancient, um, will not survive abroad. It can only survive in your homeland. So we are trying our best to give hope for the Syrian Christian community. And, um, you know, we've tried to, what we are trying to do is sustainability. Try to stop the bleeding so that there's a better situation 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now. We can't reverse, unfortunately, what ISIS did. And even before ISIS, you know, minorities like the Yazidis and the Christians have been getting destroyed before 2014, since 2003, because of extremist targeting. That has led to such a gradual population decline. So what we are trying to do now is just to help with a population sustainability by supporting marginalized communities in order for these communities to be in a stronger position to empower themselves in the near future. 
Nor, thank you for clarifying that point about the Chaldean Christians being a, a community that dates back 6,000 years and having um, their own Aramaic language and uh, and being an ethnic group as well as a religious group. Um, and, and I think, again, this is part of this incredibly rich, diverse, unique history in the region that people are just not familiar with. And so I, I so much appreciate your, your sharing that with our audience. So, Noor, um, I've looked at some of the footage that you've put out on the internet. And again, you know, the, the rubble, the destruction, it's heartbreaking to see. Are you optimistic that there is potential for future generations of different religious and ethnic minority groups to live in Iraq? And never mind, you know, even the, the uh, mainstream Muslims uh, who live in Iraq. Are you optimistic for a future there? I do. Uh, I do because I, I strongly believe in this country. Uh, because of the rich history this country has, it has some really unique features that nobody else has, that nobody else can compete, compete with. You know, economic advantage can only go a long way. But here you have a history of 6,000 years of, it, of 6, years that makes the society really unique, really special. And unfortunately, what happened, you know, with the terrorism and, 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 and all the suffering and the destruction is, is, is really sad. It does not reflect what the country really is. The country, the people here are really peaceful. Uh, I welcome anybody to come now. Iraq is safe now. And check it out for yourself. And I, and I am not exaggerating and I'm not biased because I'm from here. However, it can't be done by themselves alone. Unfortunately, we have a very bad governmental situation with the corruption and stuff. So it is crucial, it is crucial that the international community and the people abroad hold these marginalized communities hand in the time being until they are strong enough to be able to build themselves. So as long as we have the support, then I think, it, yes, I am optimistic. Noor, and I appreciate um, what you just said about the role that the international community must play and the corruption on the ground. One question I had for you in terms of um, of the reality on the ground in Iraq today is the role of your neighboring country, Iran, and the Iranian militias that are there. Are you, I know you're in Erbil, are you, um, are you aware of the Iranian militias? Are you seeing um, how they're affecting the politics and the environment? I mean, we see terrible things in the news every day about how they uh, practically try, you know, they targeted the prime minister and uh, are really um, turning the country in the wrong direction yeah un un unfortunately like i can't really be frank about you know the iranian situation and 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 those groups uh because unfortunately you know we operate in in places that that they are present but what what i can say is unfortunately it is a destabilizing factor and we all know it but the problem is we, we can't fix it. Um, it's unfortunately a very complex situation where, you know, the people that have control of the security say, if we don't continue to stay control of your security, then those bad guys will come. So I hope people understand the difficult and dire situation that the average Iraqi is at. We unfortunately are not in a situation where we are able to determine our destiny since it's being influenced and controlled by external forces. Well, amen to that, Noor. And, uh, and you know, my heart is with the people in Iraq and I can only imagine the struggles and the daily, the daily struggles that you have to, uh, have to get through. Noor, one of the things that um, I thought would be so fascinating for our audience about you, and so if we could talk a bit about this. So, uh, you know, you spent all these formative years of your life in the United States. You're like this American kid who goes to Iraq and you start this uh, radio show and do some television as well. What What is your experience with bringing this uh, kind of Americana and uh, a radio show that you have modeled after your own favorite favorite radio uh, show in Detroit? What is that like? Yeah, so that was one of uh, 
main uh, like concept I was trying to uh, approach our situation. We have, you can't put Iraq in one basket. We have different societies, we have different cultures, we have different levels. In the North, of course, uh, it's a little more open uh, in terms of accepting different uh, community, different societies and, and Western oriented ideas. So despite that, the place is still pretty conservative. So I, I thought, you know, um, by having a, a, a connection, you know, to the West, the community here will naturally start becoming more open minded. And we don't say that directly. The message is not that directly, but by having uh, topics that they can relate to and people from the outside community, outside the country can relate to, automatically leads to people seeing each other saying, ah, oh, so we do have some similarities with each other. And then that automatically leads to a society slowly becoming more open-minded, specifically the younger people. So that was the target audience. And, and we can honestly say that in, in, in the 10 years that I have witnessed in terms of me being involved with media, today's youth is a lot more open-minded. Today's youth um, especially within the, our city, of course. Again, it's different from different parts of the country, but in Erbil, today's youth is more than willing to engage with people outside of the country, regardless of their nationalities or ethnicity. And that's a good thing. And, and they are more accepting of people from outside coming, even living here with them. So that was the ultimate goal. And I can honestly say we have achieved that and it is increasing day by day in terms of its influence. Well, it's it's really interesting to hear that, and I think it's the notion of soft power, and uh, and how American values sometimes go into different countries in surprising ways that people wouldn't expect. So, when you say that you think the younger generation in Iraq, uh, or specifically, especially, let's say in Erbil where you are, um, that they're more open to the West. Are you seeing that they're mo more open on issues of coexistence, of religious tolerance, of women's rights? Are you seeing those issues? 100%. There is a change. Iraq is changing and it's changing for the good. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I have, again, witnessed it in just a 10-year period. And I'm more than certain we will see an even more of a rapid change in the 10 coming years. And, and it's all because of all these good influencing being done in the right way um, that lead to a bigger benefit than, you know, just, you know, taking over a country and then changing the government and hoping that the government will, will make everything better. So I, I am optimistic about that. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us on Global Perspectives. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. What I find as a native Middle Easterner living in the West is an attitude of resignation towards the Middle East North Africa region that would have us believe that countries like Iraq, Lebanon and Syria are somehow destined for living under terror and devastation. Listening to Nurmati reminded me of how false these assumptions are. It's time for the United States and Western powers to face down all of the evils which plague the MENA region, and for us to understand that these countries are not destined for destruction. As Noor said, Iraq is open for tourism. Thanks for joining me on Global Perspectives. Join me the next time.